Hi, my name is Kevin Backhouse and I'm a security researcher at GitHub. This is a video of an exploit that I wrote for Ubuntu's crash reporting system. In this voiceover, I'm going to explain what's happening. At the very beginning of the video, I ran a few commands to show what version of Ubuntu is running. I also ran pidovnc to show that netcat isn't running yet, so I didn't cheat. At the end of the video, you're going to see me get a shell as the whoopsie user which gives me the ability to read any crash report, even those generated by system processes. The reason why that's interesting is that I previously found a different vulnerability, CV 2019-7307, that enabled me to include the contents of any file on the system in a crash report. So combining that exploit with the exploit that you'll see in this video, I can read the contents of any file on the system. To get this exploit to work, I had to chain together two separate bugs. The first bug is CVE 2019-15790, which is an information disclosure vulnerability in AppPort. AppPort is the component of the crash reporting system that is called by the kernel when a crash happens. It gets the core dump from the kernel, and then it writes crash report in the directory slash bar slash crash. It also adds other information to the crash report, and the thing that I care about is that it includes the ASLR offsets for the process. It gets those offsets by reading the maps file in the slash proc slash pid directory for the crashed process. What's happening here is that I'm using pid recycling to trick it into reading the maps file in the whoopsie process, which doesn't belong to me. By the way, I'm specifically interested in whoopsie, but you could use the pid recycling bug on any system service. It's generically useful for exploiting any memory corruption vulnerability. That pop-up that you just saw there is AppPort GTK, which just noticed that there's a new crash report in slash bar slash crash. It only checks every three minutes. AppPort GTK doesn't have elevated privileges, so I'm ignoring it. The second bug is CVE 2019-11484, which is a heap buffer overflow in Whoopsie. Whoopsie is the process that is responsible for uploading crash reports to daisy.ubuntu.com. Whoopsie Daisy, get it? The bug is a heap, overflow, heap buffer overflow on a 2 gigabyte string. I got lucky because the area of memory that I'm able to corrupt contains a memory allocator called the G-Slice magazine allocator, but I'm pretty sure that it would be impossible to exploit without knowing the ASLR offsets. And even with that information, it isn't easy. The problem is that the string has to be valid UTF-8, and it cannot contain any bytes lower than 32. So that severely limits my ability to write valid addresses that will alter the behavior of the allocator in a way that won't just make it crash. So what you're seeing here is that the, ex that the exploit is repeatedly crashing Whoopsie. Because Whoopsie is a system service, it restarts automatically. I have to be careful not to crash it too often because it won't restart if it crashes more than five times in 10 seconds. But as you can see, that isn't actually a problem because it takes Whoopsie more like 15 seconds every time to process the two gigabyte file and crash. What I'm waiting for is some ASLR offsets that are compliant with the UTF-8 restriction. The other thing that's slowing things down is that the PID recycling needs to guess the PID of the new Whoopsie when it restarts, and it doesn't always guess correctly. Only when you see it saying diff equals zero, that's when it has guessed correctly and can read the ASLR offset. At this point of the video, I've finally got a whoopsie with suitable ASLR offset, so the real exploit is ready to begin. I'm going to trigger whoopsie to process the two gigabyte file five times. The first four times are to trigger the heap overflow and overwrite the G-slice allocator with some fake blocks. One of the things that you can see happening here is that it's timing exactly how long it takes to take to Whoopsie to load the two gigabyte file. That's because timing is very important in the fifth step. There's a short period of time, probably half a second or so, where Whoopsie is busy mem copying the two gigabyte string into a malloced buffer. During that period of time, I have complete control over that area of memory and I don't have to worry about the UTF-8 restriction. The only byte that I cannot write is a new line character, because that is used to terminate the string. So I can set up some fake heap data structures, one of which contains the address of the system function. Then I trigger a quick flurry of memory allocations, which cause the sources, source lists pointer in glib worker context to get overwritten with a pointer into the memory that I control. And the next thing that happens is that the system function gets called. So that worked, and now I'm going back to the other terminal. 
There's a netcat listening on port 1337 now, so I can connect to that, and now I have a shell as the whoopsie user. As a quick demo of what I can do with that, I'm going to create a file and give it the set UID bit. A slightly more sophisticated version of that would give me the ability to become Whoopsy whenever I feel like it without needing to run the exploit again. And that's about it. I'll be posting the source code for this exploit soon on github.com forward slash saml forward slash security exploits. Thanks.